Vaccine hesitance is as, as old as vaccination. You know, you, you hear from somebody getting the vaccine that they had some sort of adverse event um, or they correlate a, a death after a vaccine with the vaccine itself. You hear from people who are in positions of power or are well known, say something about the vaccine and you kind of believe it. And in more recent years, we have social media, right? We have our algorithms that tell us what we want to want to hear. And so if I'm already vaccine hesitant, I'm going to feed into that or, or get fed back by social media about all the myths of vaccination and I'm going to be more likely to be anti-vaccine. Whereas before they used to have to publish their own pamphlets or write their own books. Now they just get online on their phones and can send this message out to thousands of followers. So here we are in late January 2022 and we have about 20% of children ages 5 to 12 fully vaccinated against COVID-19. And for children 12 to 18, it's 55%. What we have seen with COVID is that children who are very young uh, don't usually get it. And if they do get it, their symptoms resolve. And that's it, they're immune unless another variant comes around. There is this view that if it doesn't cause very severe disease, then we shouldn't be worrying about it. But the problem with that kind of thinking is that we have millions of children in the United States. And if millions of children get it, a sizable proportion of those, we still don't know how many, but we are seeing the numbers increase, are going to be either hospitalized, they're going to unfortunately pass away, or they're going to have something like long, long COVID or some uh, multi-system inflammatory disease. And so given enough children getting it, we're going to have a problem with the years of therapy that they're going to need. Another concern with children getting COVID is that they could contribute to new variants arising because they'll get the infection, the body will not clear it fast enough, and COVID-19 has shown to mutate quite quickly. If you're vaccinated, you clear it pretty pretty quickly, even before you have symptoms. Sometimes you have very, very few symptoms, but if you're not vaccinated or otherwise immune from a previous infection, you get infected, the virus begins its process, you get enough of those people together, it's going to take a while for everybody to get better, and in that time it allows for the virus to mutate and become yet another strain. And so we're seeing these strains coming out of populations that are low vaccinated. And so the safest thing to do is to vaccinate to prevent all that from happening to begin with, because it has been shown time and time again that children who are vaccinated not only do not have long COVID or multisystem inflammatory disease, they do much better if and when they do catch it. The precise uh, proportion of the population that needs to be immune, uh, known as herd immunity, for the virus to go away, right? It's, it's, it's always a moving target. It depends because what is your herd, right? What is your population? Are we talking about your classroom, your home, your city, your town, your state? So as a country, it's going to have to be between 70 and 80 percent of every age group. And this includes five and under being immune for this to become an endemic virus or maybe even a best case scenario just going away. Some of the concerns that we have seen from parents kind of echo things that we have heard throughout history. The vaccine is too new, there's not enough follow-up time, we don't know where it came from, the government is trying to track us, the government is trying to control us, my body is my choice, etc. We are seeing it again with COVID-19 where people think that because the vaccines were developed within a year of the, the virus, then somehow they're too new. I understand, I have a four-year-old, you know, and I'm very protective of my, my little girl and I'm, I'm very worried about environmental hazards to her. But frankly, just looking at the evidence, the viruses are more of a danger to her than the vaccines. There are other things that you need to do to protect your children. Uh, put them in car safety seats, wear helmets. This is completely a social controversy. It is not a scientific one. We have a lot of layers of safety. It's not just CDC looking at adverse events. It's local health departments, state health departments, academics doing research about adverse events, and then the pharmaceutical companies themselves. You know, nothing would be better for Pfizer than for the Moderna vaccine to be dangerous. And so when people say that there's this conspiracy to hide adverse events, there really is, and you can't. It's, it's not something that you can easily hide. One of the things that we can do to increase the number of vaccinated people is to continue to talk about the benefits of vaccination, our own personal histories. One of the things that we know in public health is that we are more prone to listen to people who are like us. Dr. Fauci and others, they certainly are speaking the truth and they're very passionate about it. But until we hear it from somebody like us, then it really comes in, into our conscience. And so parents who have vaccinated their children need to tell other parents. And if they had an adverse reaction, be honest about what that adverse reaction was, medical history that could have cost it, etc. But it's going to take a, a lot of conversations, a lot of civil discourse about vaccination, about the need for it, about why it's not dangerous, backed up by the evidence and the science. I think it will go a long way. There are instances where the state can uh, compel you to vaccinate your child against your own wishes 
because the public health and the health of your child is, is above uh, your philosophical or religious beliefs. The smallpox vaccine was developed in the late 1700s, around 1797, by Dr. Edward Jenner in the UK. By 1850, it was really established in Massachusetts that children attending public schools had to get the smallpox vaccination. There was some hesitancy by parents of, about getting the smallpox vaccine. Obviously, this was, you know, before we knew what caused disease. This is you know, when germ theory was barely coming into its own. But uh, at the prospect of getting the cowpox vaccine that prevented smallpox that did not cause disease like virulation used to do, they, they were actually pretty encouraged by that. As the number of vaccines for childhood diseases increased, then you saw the number of cases drop. And more importantly, the number of deaths from, from those diseases really, really dropped. And the cases eventually just kind of withered away to where we have only a handful of those cases now. By the 1980s, we get this schedule of vaccination like we know it today, where, you know, you have a range of dates that a child should get their vaccines to prevent outbreak. And more state legislatures adopt the vaccine schedule requirement for school then you see more parents adopted. And so we get to where we are now, where more than 90% of parents are vaccinating their children. A few years ago, California decided to do away with religious and philosophical exemptions to vaccination. And you would think, based on the numbers before that, that many parents were going to be homeschooling or they were going to go to private schools that didn't require this. But that wasn't the case. Many parents decided to vaccinate their children once that requirement was put in and the exemption was taken away. So that shows us that given only the option of a medical exemption, parents will vaccinate. You'll still have that very small number that are fixated on the myths of vaccination. And there's not much we can do about that. But vaccine requirements really do help boost the number of children who are vaccinated. We kind of just go along with it if it's going to be an inconvenience.